AI is obviously one of the things that is on the tops of everybody's mind and everybody is talking about, everybody is thinking about implementing, everybody is worried about falling behind and how is it going to transform our business? So today, what I really want to do is talk a little bit about where we are right now, where we've been and kind of where we're going, talking about the history a little bit of the consortium, some work on different machine learning, automation, digital transformation, any buzzword on top of it that you'd like, and how we've, we've been thinking about this for the last decade plus, as well as give some examples of three member companies and how they're approaching implementing AI and some of the things they're doing with AI. Every day, we have more and more examples of companies that are leveraging all kinds of different machine learning technologies to do things. I was on a call earlier today with the European KCS community. DNV presented on their KCS implementation and talked about how they're playing with uh, AI in article creation and article um, curation and things like that. So lots of stuff going on. Every day we're talking to people that are playing around with these technologies. So where have we been and where are we going? Services has always been an organization, a way of working that focuses on technology and technology as a driver for change. Whether that goes back 30 plus years, 40 years now, where call centers started to centralize support based on the fact that we had computers, we had stronger telephone systems. So we could take, and instead of having to send everybody out on site to do work, we could start to centralize our operations into call centers and have customers call us. Move forward into the mid nineties and the internet comes along and really enhances how we can do content delivery. Well, if we're gonna be delivering content, how do we think about capturing that content? And KCS starts to come along thinking about, well, how can I leverage all the information that I'm now gathering to create something that I can deliver back to our customers, back to our employees to be more efficient. Then as we got into the 2000s, 2010s, digital transformation, really sophisticated self-service communities all started to explode around the services industry. And a lot of it is being powered by KCS. So we've been on this 30 plus year journey of leveraging technologies to drive how support services organizations are working. But boy, it feels like the last 12 to 18 months have been a massive disruption, and it has gone from a steady transformation from crawling to walking to running to an expectation that we're absolutely taking off, and we're flying, and we're all Superman, and it is just, what are you doing with AI, and how is it going to make us more efficient? How am I going to be better because of it? And that has really been a compressed timeline. Why is that? Well, it's kind of been coming for years and years and years, and AI is not all that new. Uh, in, in doing some of our reading and research, I actually read the entire proposal here, which is fascinating to read. But it's from 1955, where the term artificial intelligence is first kind of documented in a proposal to do a summer research project on artificial intelligence. And from the paper, it is to get some scientists together to make machines use language to form abstractions and concepts that are normally reserved for humans and to have those machines improve themselves. Well, it sounds like you could take that sentence and use it today to talk to people about what Gen AI is doing and what we're doing in our organization. So it's been a long journey to get to where we're going. There's also quite a few papers out there uh, that talk about how support organizations have been using Gen AI before it was called Gen AI in large language models for quite a long time. So there, there isn't really a inflection point that we've hit. It's been more of an acceleration in our technology and capabilities. And I think there's kind of two ways to break down what's fueling that acceleration. So one is just the computing power our ability to have stronger and stronger hardware, the explosion of data. Right now, computing power is doubling every one and a half to two years. It's actually starting to slow down. It looks like it's moving more to three years based on hardware limitations and things like that. But also, if you look at going back in history, whenever we feel like we've hit a hardware limitation, somebody comes up with a complete new model and a complete new hardware that allows us to continue to uh, accelerate it, doubling about every two years. 
And data has always been the currency of support in the form of knowledge. And this raw material, the solar energy of the data industry and powering data science and AI is all of that data that we've been collecting. The other big advancement is the new algorithms for machine learning. Interesting article from MIT talking about how because we're hitting more and more limitations on hardware, the algorithms themselves are what is driving a lot of the advancement now. And as you start to think about, we have billions or trillions of data points that we're trying to bring together. It becomes more about how can the algorithms handle that as opposed to we just need faster and faster hardware based on the original algorithms that were created. And we're seeing AI as a service. So whether it's Amazon, Google, OpenAI, or the hundreds of other applications out there, we now have easy access to development tools to build our own AI applications. And software companies are building AI into their products. So we don't even know whether it's being used by AI. It's just an interface that I use, and it's doing magic behind the scenes. So it's becoming so much easier for us to actually experience what these things are and see the future that they can bring to us. Like I said, the consortium has a bit of a history with thinking about machine learning in services because of our focus on the support and services industry. Going back and looking at team meetings and consortium conversations and all the work the consortium's been doing, it really was about 2012, 2013, that we first started to see language around machine learning driven automation. You can absolutely find automation well before that, even when just talking about CRM tools and um, websites and things like that. But machine learning driven automation really started to become a big topic in about 2012, 2013 across the consortium membership. In 2014, we started to work on the predictive and proactive support model under what the consortium at that time was calling the customer success initiative. So it's the first time that we start to see words like predictive and proactive driven by machine learning. So how do we move up the curve, the value erosion curve, if anybody has seen that, to get much more proactive so that we're not waiting for customers to do some web searching, then maybe ask their friends a couple questions, then open a case with a support. But how do you move up that value erosion curve to the point where I can get in front of my customer much faster when they have a problem or even start to predict that they're going to have a problem? That drove quite a bit of work by member companies at the member summit in San Diego in 2015, Salesforce and PTC presented on Internet of Things and machine learning to drive proactive and predictive support. And we kind of finalized the original predictive customer engagement model, which companies like PTC and Salesforce and others were using as a bit of a roadmap to play with these technologies. Fast forward a year to two years, members continue to iterate. The new ML and LLM models are coming into play. We're seeing much better computing. So we're seeing a lot of advancement in 2016 and 17 in member use cases. Still very homegrown though. So most of the members at that time were still building their own models and building their own AI to try and solve problems. But we start to see use cases becoming a major topic as these capabilities are expanding. In 2017, during a consortium team meeting, there is a list of potential use cases for machine learning. I took those use cases and I compared them to the ones that we talked about in 2023. And boy, there's a lot of overlap. So going back to 2017, consortium members were already identifying a lot of the use cases and a lot of the things that we thought machines would be able to automate for us in the future. 2018 to 2022, really an explosion of vendor available solutions, both in app and as a service. So think like Salesforce Einstein really came out and was really being used quite a bit. So lots of tools were being embedded into applications that you could purchase or use. And Microsoft, Google, Amazon, were all starting to offer tools where as a AI developer, I didn't need to develop all the AI code. I could use their AI to do the work that I needed to do. So we're seeing a lot of maturing in the large language model arena. And members continue to explore, implement, share, PTC, Oracle, Cisco, Akamai, lots of companies coming back and sharing what they're doing with these models. And 2023 hit, and there's this explosion of Gen AI. In the services world and in the knowledge management world, there's so much excitement around Gen AI because it seems like it is a tailored solution to these heavily knowledge-driven organizations. 
we've been talking about how do we leverage all this content we're creating and Gen AI seems to give us a perfect solution to leverage all of the knowledge that we've been capturing for all of these years. So lots of energy started restarted around 2023 when Gen AI, we could go play with Gen AI member summit 2023 back in San Diego. It's kind of weird that it was San Diego to San Diego from 15 to 2023. Brad Smith had led some work leveraging Gen AI to do a whole bunch of stuff for the consortium he presented on. How did we use Gen AI to do these things and what were the prompts and, and what, what did we use to train the Gen AI model? So 2023 saw kind of that excitement around Gen AI really start to grab on at the uh, consortium members. This renewed energy is, I believe, for us because the tools are finally catching up. So for years, we've been talking about what if we could have something that summarizes our case notes into, into an overview and next steps. Can we make relevant connections between people and content based on lots of different repositories and then create new dynamic articles based on all of these different repositories to give back answers to our customers? Can we uncover trends in our cases and our communities and across all of these different data sets that we just can't see or can't manually get to? So we've been talking about this for years. Now the tools feel like they're catching up to let us do that. Member companies have captured 30 six very specific use cases for AI around knowledge and services. Uh, definitely a big bent on knowledge and KCS and where we can leverage uh, AI in a KCS environment. But we're also seeing some of those now in production. And I'll talk a little bit about those later when I talk about the things that uh, our member companies are doing. They're taking a lot of these potential use cases and then saying, well, how do we move these into production? And we're starting to see them in production. It's not just us that are uh, talking about AI and the renewed energy, it's really everyone. Uh, this is a collection of open space topics at the Consortium's 23 Summit, uh, as well as topics at other events that we have uh, attended over the last six to nine months, ranging from how are people being impacted by AI and what is the role of humans in the AI world to moving tacit knowledge to explicit knowledge using AI? How do we think about good customer experience and how can AI help us with customer experience? Range of topics that are being discussed across the industry on different impacts of AI and how we can leverage AI. A great study done by Rashad Najjar on where and how generative AI specifically is accelerating knowledge use cases, areas, processes. They identified 35 processes across experience, implementation, and execution. They did this by looking at 100 knowledge management solutions that are integrating generative AI. So instead of saying, well, what are all the possible use cases? What are all the different things that we could do with AI? They said, well, what are vendors doing? So what solutions are vendors developing to try and solve the problems across the industry? So a bit of a, I'd say, a, a different approach than the way we have approached it, saying, well, what are all the use cases? They're saying, well, what are the vendors doing? It's exciting for me that looking at what the vendors are spending their time, money, and energy on in developing is customer service is by far where they're spending most of their energy to try and develop tools to help us which is exciting and not that surprising since when I look across the list of vendors here, there are several that are member companies of the consortium. You see Zendesk in there. I saw, I thought that he was on. So I see that Zendesk is here today. Lots of energy is being put into these companies into customer service. Those seven knowledge activity, or the 35 knowledge processes were broken down into seven different knowledge activities. And under each of these activities, they articulate what are the processes or the experience or the execution that AI is going to have an impact on, including knowledge center service, but it's not specifically our case. Yes, it's more talking just about knowledge center service in general and how you do that. So, but a great paper, and we'll have links to some of these different resources uh, available when after the the presentation. So you can go read the paper. Super interesting. But we're not quite there yet. I assume like many of you on the call today, I got to watch a whole bunch of sports over the Olympics that I never, ever get to watch. And I was fascinated by archery simply because I can't imagine being able to hit a target as far away as they were hitting a target. But I think we're, we're not quite there yet. So with all these use cases and all the activities and all the things we're seeing, we aren't realizing the AI, AI promise quite yet. So we're getting closer and closer, but we're not quite there. It really is a hype cycle that we're in, and AI is offering us solutions that are looking for problems. 
And I love this idea of digital Darwinism and that the technology is moving so fast that it's hard for businesses or individuals to adapt and transform their businesses at the speed with which the technology has advanced. That kind of goes back to my uh, first slide talking about for 30 years, we moved from crawling to walking to running. And then in this very short time, all of a sudden, we're supposed to have adopted this brand new technology, put it into production and completely transformed our business. And a lot of this is a fear of missing out. So I can't go a week without three or four articles popping into my inbox from all of the big, very good houses out there like Forbes or Harvard, Bain, Gartner, LinkedIn, CIO.com, go on and on and on talking about AI and the transformation in business. But it's making it feel like we're falling behind. AI improves employee productivity by 66%. Okay, well, that's a pretty impressive number. What do you mean you can actually improve it by 66%? Here are 20 AI tools to supercharge your business. So I, I need to go buy 20 different tools now to supercharge my business. Almost half enterprises risk falling behind on AI. So there's this sense that if I'm not doing something right now and seeing immediate results, I'm falling behind everybody else. And I, I just don't think that's actually true. I had the pleasure of seeing Dave Snowden speak. Um, this is a rough quote because he said this, it's not something he wrote. But he basically said, if we add up all the promised efficiency gains that the big consulting firms and tech companies have proven that we, we would see if we buy what they're selling us over the last 10 years, we'd be working in negative days a week by now. So you have to understand that there is a industry out there now trying to push us to sell us on ideas. And the fear of missing out is a very powerful way to get us to spend money. So as we think through the hype versus the reality, I love the, uh, the Gartner technology hype cycle developed by Gartner based on work by the New Jersey Innovation Institute. But it gives us a bit of a roadmap to talk about. We, we see a technology trigger. That technology trigger is so exciting, so new, so overwhelming that it drives us to this peak of inflated expectations where we think it's going to change everything overnight. Then we start to realize that maybe it's harder than we think it is to leverage this new technology and we sink down to the trough of disillusionment. But the reality is the technology is groundbreaking. So we're eventually going to move our way back up to this plateau of productivity where we start to implement things and we start to see the value of it. It would be hard to argue that chat GPT being released. I know there were chat GPTs before November of 2022, but the version released in November of 2022 and made super readily available to everybody was a technology disruptor because it took this new large language model, this gen AI, and made it so easy for us to go into a website and ask it a question and have it spit back something that was pretty amazing that it could do. I would argue that we're probably somewhere near the peak of inflated expectations. And I say that because yes, there's still a lot of hype, but we're starting to see the reality as well. We're starting to see the reality in our businesses and our personal lives. So I'm not sure if we're gonna continue to see more and more hype or if, OpenAI or Google or Amazon is going to release something new that makes us continue the hype or if we've, we've started down. But I think we're somewhere near the peak. One of the things that member companies are working on and we have uh, some working sessions on is, well, how do we minimize or eliminate the trough of disillusionment? So as we're now at this peak of inflated expectations and we're hearing this from our executives and we're hearing this from our business how do we minimize the drop off? So how do we kind of make sure that as we start to realize the realities of implementing these tools, how do we get to the plateau of productivity much, much faster?